Good, good morning. Uh, please stand and join us in praising the Lord. Welcome to Christ Community Church. We're glad you're here joining us, whether in person or online. Uh, we're so glad you're here. There is a text number on the screen. If you would like to text in a prayer request, we would love to pray for you. Um, and be sure to include your name if you want us to know who you are. Reading from Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Please continue praising the Lord with us. We will feast in the house of Zion. Say 
be seated. Any children going to children's worship can meet uh, Miss Audra in the back. Now, all right, enthusiasm. Uh, this morning's scripture is from 1 Corinthians 13. Um, if you happen to not have a Bible with you, there are some scattered among the seats. Um, and on th in that Bible, uh, this is on page 902. Uh, again, 1 Co Corinthians 13. Hear the word of the Lord. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning and welcome to Christ Community Church. I'm Rich Conkling, one of the elders here, and um, we'll go into prayer. Uh, there is a number for the uh, praise or prayer line. Uh, so again, as Darren has mentioned, if you have a praise or prayer request, uh, please feel free to text it to that number. Um, and uh, feel free, if you want to remain anonymous, that's fine. Or if you want us to know uh, who you are, uh, that's fine as well, too. So um, the way we'll do this is we'll um, go into the Word, and then we'll take a few moments to confess our sins before the Almighty God, and uh, then we'll continue with prayer and um, so forth. So uh, this morning I'd like to, uh, to read a little bit from First Chronicles 16. Give praise to the Lord. Proclaim his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him. Sing praise to him. Tell of all his wonderful acts. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord in his strength. Seek his face always. Remember the wonders he has done, his miracles, and the judgments he pronounced. You, his servants, the descendants of Israel, his chosen ones, the children of Jacob. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning knowing that your hand is in every single thing. The sun, the skies, we just we praise you for all of that. We praise you for all of the, the blessings that you have bestowed upon us. Lord, we come seeking this morning. Some of us seeking fellowship with others. Some of us seeking healing. Some of us seeking knowledge and wisdom. 
Some of us may be not even knowing what we seek, Lord, hoping to find something, hoping to find your, your vision. Please, open our eyes to your wondrous acts. Open our hearts to the Holy Spirit that we might dwell within it. And God, just be with us this morning. God, we thank you for, for Pastor Mike. We thank you for the time that he has had to, to rejuvenate and to, to seek your will and to, to be with you. We thank you for allowing him safe travels and passage. God, we also thank you for Pastor Wes and um, Reggie and, and all of the, the pastors and ministers that will be preaching the word today, the gospel of your word. Let those voices be heard. Let they sound out throughout the land, throughout our city, throughout our country. God, we thank you for the opportunity to be with, with Reggie and, and his wife, Abby, this morning. Thank you for, for bringing them to us. And let his words be, be God spoken this morning. God, we, we have many things that we ask. Um, we ask that you, you be with our, our missionaries, uh, the Ben Parada family that are beginning a, a new training class with men in Bangkok, but be with all of the, the uh, missionaries throughout the, the country and throughout the world. Lord, it is, it is their effort to spread the gospel, to make disciples. Let us all feel that same that same pull, that same fire within us, that we may speak to people about you and praise you. God, we know that there are those among us that, that have health issues and concerns. You know what they are. I would just ask that you, you be with them and put your healing hand upon them. Help the caregivers and the doctors with wisdom. And most of all, give them peace to know that you are at work, that you are always at work in our lives, no matter where we are. For you, you meet us where we are at but thankfully, you do not leave us there. You lead us, you teach us, and you guide us. God, we, we thank you for blessings of family as we begin to, to go into the seasons of Thanksgiving and Christmas. Let us be renewed in our in our worship and our, our praise of family because they've been beside us and they have guided us and, and they, have, they have loved. What an awesome thing, God, that we can love because you first loved us. God, we know that we have left things undone and, and not done things that we should have done. And we know that, that it was our sin, our sin that, that Jesus paid the price for on that cross in Calgary. God, we just, we take a moment to, to confess our sins before you.
God, we know that in our faith that if we confess our sins, you will cast them into the deepest oceans. As far as the east is from the west, as far as the, the highest mountains, those sins will be forgotten and forgiven. We take hold of that promise and we, we take refuge in that knowledge. But Lord, help us to, to be better and to do your will so that we may, may fully earn the title of being your children, that we may be able to praise and honor you in everything that we do. God, and we thank you for your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, My Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, forever, forever, and ever. Amen. And it's my pleasure to introduce Reggie Blackman and uh, let him preach the word of the gospel this morning. Thank you. Take care. Here we go. Amen. That sounds good. There we go. There we go. Praise God. Praise God. You know, I anticipated that happening. So I said, you know what? When it happens, I'm not even going to worry about it. We're just going to keep rocking and rolling. So we're all good. Amen. Well, um, what a blessing to be before you all today, um, giving all glory to God for the opportunity to minister um, with you all. Um, thanks to Pastor Mike, to the, those who are um, elders and ministers here in the house um, awesome time in worship, um, and then I also have to um, say thank you to my home church, Lateran Ministries, um, which is Northeast Fort Wayne, um, where I am in ministry there, um, and then to my lovely wife, uh, always appreciate your love and support, amen, along the way. So, um, yeah, it, it feels like home now when I, when I come in and, and minister here because you guys are always so welcoming. Um, I always enjoy just being able to spend some time um, diving into the Word, hearing about what God is doing in you all's lives as we con conversate and things. Um, but today, we're going to jump into 1 Corinthians 13, and you heard the Word read. And I, I love how many um, times Scripture is just read to the body because it's so healthy, because that's what keeps us in right alignment with where God wants us to be. Amen. And so... Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and this should be a familiar passage of Scripture to those who I call seasoned saints, those who uh, have, have been in, in ministry maybe your whole lives or all your whole adult life or, you know, for a number of years, and, or if you're like me, born in the, in the front row of a church, amen. So uh, 1 Corinthians 13, and I'm going to read it again, um, and then we're going to dive in. So it says, Starting at verse 1, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. 
If I give away all that I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror, dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Hallelujah, Lord. I thank you for this time of, of fellowship, Lord. This time of ministering your word. Father, I pray that as this time goes forth, Lord, that you may speak through me. Use me as a vessel. Father, I pray for the hearts and the minds, the ears of your people. Let they be open to hear the word of the Lord. Let it permeate their beings, Lord, and cause for their lives to be transformed and renewed. Father, I thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit that compels us to love, even as you love us first. We thank you, Lord, that as we love, that we may be created in your image and more after your likeness. Father, that we may have righteousness be throughout our bodies and throughout our beings as we walk this thing called life. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so um, as I jump into the, today's um, message, I'm going to go back to a time I remember, um, like I said, I was born in, in, in the front row, so I remember being in church at an early age, and I remember being in third grade, and I don't remember what the sermon was that Sunday, but I'm telling you, it was one of those messages. I think I was back in children's church, and that's why children's church is so, so important. But I remember being back in children's church, and whatever it was that I heard that Sunday, I just remember going to school on Monday and being absolutely on fire. I'm going to tell all my friends about Jesus. I'm going to preach the gospel to one of my friends. I want all of my friends to know Jesus and to be saved and their lives to be transformed. And one of my good friends, Debbie, Debbie was a Jehovah's Witness, um, and we had many conversations at that time in third grade. I don't really know, like, you know, all the ins and outs about Christianity, about Jehovah's Witness, about all of the different religions and all that kind of stuff, but what I do remember is that I knew that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. I remember knowing that I was broken over my sin and that I needed the Savior, and his name was Jesus. And so here, Debbie and I are having a conversation one day during class because like I always did, I was always distracting people from right, paying attention, right? The teachers up there teaching, I'm having a conversation quietly, of course. Um, but, but we get into this dialogue about what it means to be a Christian. And what I started to find is that as I'm so passionately sharing, man, Jesus can transform your life, and Jesus is so good, and of all that he's done, and died on the cross for our sins, all the things that I hear in Sunday school every week, right? As I'm sharing this, she starts to say things that she and I disagreed on. And as I'm listening, I'm like, how can you not, how can you not understand that what you're saying is wrong. What you're saying is, no, this is not, that's not, that's not it. That's not the way this is supposed to go. That's not the way this works. Like, and, and I remember it got so bad to the point where I was so angry that I started to just say, you know what? There's no hope for you. You're just, you're just lost. You don't get it. You're never going to get it. You're not going to understand and I actually ended up, like, making some kind of insult or something along the way. And she actually ended up telling the teacher on me. And I had to turn my card because I was making fun of her in class at this point. You know, you have the little cards, and I had to flip my card. And, um, but the reason why I brought that story up is because oftentimes, even though that was back in third grade, oftentimes that can be us. That can be us as believers. And we're going to dive into that a little bit more, in that our efforts 
to spread the gospel and the lens in which we see people as we're ministering the gospel can affect the way that we love them in the midst of sharing the gospel. And so intentions to share, share and minister, am I supposed to stay in the middle? Am I supposed to stay? If I get over here, is that, am I good to stay? Okay, okay, I'm good, all right. Just wanted to make sure I'm not off camera. Somewhere. They're like, hey, come back. But anyway, so, so in our efforts to minister the gospel, we oftentimes can, can fall into this place where we lose it, we miss it, we mess it up, and we hurt our witness. We hurt our witness. Because, you know, I don't know about you guys, but what I've realized over this life is that sometimes I'm going to be the, the only example of Jesus that people have ever seen. And so it's so important. So, jumping into our scripture, bless you. Um, bless you twice. Um, jumping to our, our scripture, um, 1 Corinthians 13, so we know the Apostle Paul is ministering to the early church and trying to establish this sense of order, this sense of direction, because people are torn in all these different directions, right? Jesus has now been resurrected. What does that mean? Where is the church? What, like, what, what, is that, what does that look like? And so he's setting all these parameters. He's given all this framework for the church of Corinthian, um, church of Corinthian. And so as we jump into the scripture, he's, he's talking about these gifts, right? These gifts that some people are given, right? So he's talking about prophecies. He's talking about, um, um, if we look here, speaking in tongues of men and of angels, right? This gift that, you, that some were given. Um, and, and then he talks about um, the prophetic powers and understanding all mysteries and all knowledge, right? And so you can be all, have all these gifts, right? You can, you can know how to, to move people. You can be really powerful when you pray. And when you pray, it feels like, man, the whole atmosphere just shifted and changed. And like, man, like you're really close to God and, and all these things. But if you have not love, that they merit nothing. And so here I was, feeling on fire, feeling like, man, I know the gospel through and through. But the message lacked love. And at one point in time, it turned to where I ended up hurting my witness. Um, and, and so let's jump in. Now turn with me uh, to 2 Timothy 2 Timothy 3.16. I got my little sticky notes in here because I wanted to make sure I knew where I was going. Um, 2 Corinthians 3.16. I'm sorry, 2 Timothy. I'm sorry, sorry. Y'all good. See, I caught it. Good job. Y'all passed the test. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16. And this is once again the Apostle Paul. Um, and verse 16 says, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. I'm going to read that one more time. All Scripture is breathed out by God. And that, that word breathe, there's a Greek word that I don't really know how to pronounce, but it's theo, theopneustos, for the best of my translation of that word. Um, but it's the first time that this, they see this word mentioned in the Bible, the first time in the Greek language that this word is mentioned. And so the Apostle Paul, they, they, they believe that he, he is coining this word, right, because he wants for this to be so impactful to understand what it means for this word to be God-breathed, right? And so we're talking about this early church and their, them understanding that as you read Scripture, that this is not man's writings, right, that this is, this is a, a supernatural um, um, happening that, that happens when Scripture is written, right? And so it says, all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. And I don't know about you guys, but I thank God for the ability to be trained in righteousness as we, as we learn to love our neighbors. And so if I had to title today's message, I should have said this earlier, if I had to title it, I would say, Loving your neighbor through righteousness. Loving your neighbor through righteousness. And I know everybody has their pens out. You guys are so, such an such, uh, awesome congregation. Everybody got their pen waiting for that note that they can write. Um, and so, loving your neighbor through righteousness. And as we read, as we read 2 Timothy 3.16, and what I want to highlight today, and so this is a familiar passage of Scripture, but what I want to highlight today 
is how the purpose of Scripture is ultimately to lead us to righteousness, not just good works. To lead us towards righteousness and not just good works. See, there's a lot of practical things that we can get out of Scripture. There are a lot of like, man, oh, I, I need to help my neighbor. Or when I see a man down, you know, I need to go and help him. And, and if I have the ability to give, that I need to go and do it. But what's also important, what's even more so important, is asking your question, why am I actually doing this? Why am I giving to somebody in need? Is it truly because... I want to share what God has done in my life, or is it just because of the good works that I'm capable of doing? It is so easy as believers, I'm guilty of it. It is so easy for us to get so caught up in, oh, yeah, you know, I, I did this for the kids, and, you know, I, I do youth ministry for a living. And so it's so easy to step in and say, oh, I, I listened to her story, and I was there for her in, in this time, and I was, I was there, and I listened, and she... And she was broken and she was in a bad place and and I sat there with her. Oh, how good am I? How much do I love her because I sat across from her? How much do I love him because I shot basketball with him and, and, and we got to talk about life? Well, all those gifts that God has given us, right, to be able to play basketball with a bunch of kids, for me it's playing basketball, right? throwing the football around and having conversations, the gift that he's given me to be able to do that, the gift of being able to to sit with somebody and making them feel seen and heard. Those are gifts that God has given us, right? But those gifts, without being led towards righteousness, without our focus being on righteousness and giving God glory with our lives, they profit nothing. To be able to speak into someone's life and say, this is where God is getting ready to take you, right? I, 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 I've been praying for you, and I believe that God is going to do this in your life to tell somebody that, but yet be looking for this self-fulfillment means that we're missing it. It means that we're missing it. And so um, the purpose of Scripture is ultimately to lead us towards righteousness, not just good works. And as we jump down to to now verse 4, the scripture starts to tell us and kind of create this divide, right? Because love, as we know, is this action word, right? Love is this action word because, especially for all my folks who are married, right, you know that if you don't show the actions behind saying, oh, I'm going to take the trash out, right, then do you truly love your wife when she has asked you to take the trash out? Because you could say, oh, yeah, I love you, baby, but when I ask you to do something, you know, I'm guilty of that many times. But... We know that love is an action word, right? And so the scripture says in verse 4, it says, love is patient and kind. Love is patient and kind. Going back to my my simple story back in the third grade, if I had been patient and kind throughout that conversation, who knows how God could have showed up and the Holy Spirit could have led, right? And there's grace. There's always grace. Praise God for his grace. You know, because our relationship ended up, you know, we rekindled and became friends again and all that kind of stuff. But, and I'm giving that, that minor example, but there's obviously more depth to this. But anyway, love is patient and kind. Love is patient and kind. We live in a society today where it is so easy for us to divide over being right rather than doing what's right. Being right rather than doing what's right. Because there's a huge difference. Love is patient and kind. Which means that in society, one, as believers, we shouldn't be looking to what the world is doing and reacting based off the world because we know the world is crazy. It's been crazy since Scripture was written, right? And so why should we expect any different now? However... What we can expect, what we can hold to is that other believers should be desiring righteousness, right? And when our brother, when our sister lack that ability to understand or see themselves in a fallen state, love is patient, love is kind. 
when people who are on different viewpoints, on topics, when people are, are, are seeing life or living life in a way that seems like, man, why would you want to continue to do this, a cycle of, of just doing this? You saw your grandparents do it. You saw your mom do it. You saw it, and you just continue to do the same thing. Why? That doesn't make any sense. Love is patient. Love is kind. And in that patience and in that kindness, we'll see how eventually the call is actually to bear each other's burdens and it'll transform the way that you love. So verse 4, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. Love is patient, love is kind, love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. As believers, is it your witness that you are the kindest person that someone has ever met? That you're the most patient person that someone has ever met? When they talk about, man, those people who are the least prideful for the sake of Scripture, the least prideful people, can someone say that about our witness as believers? Can they say that about Reggie? And my honest answer is sometimes. And then the other part of the time, amen, I need to go back to 1 Corinthians and and read, amen. But it does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It does not insist on its own way. And further down in the scripture, you see how it talks about at one point, on this side of heaven, right, that, man, we're going to have, we only get a, a piece of all of the truth. We only get a part of truth, and that the rest, we only get to find out on the other side of eternity, right? But how often do we hold on to these things in our lives and say, no, no, this is it. No, I promise you that this is the way. I prom-. But the only thing that we should be holding on to like that is the fact that, Jesus died on the cross for all of our sins, that we are all sinners in need of a Savior. It's the only thing that we should hold on to like that, but how many topics on a day-to-day basis is it so easy for us to hold on to in this way? And so verse 6, it says, it does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with truth. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with truth. Let's look at, um, turn to John chapter 4, another familiar passage. John chapter 4, and the scripture talking about the woman at the well. Because it's important for us to understand that love is patient and kind. Why? Because God wants our behaviors to reflect his righteousness. He wants our behaviors to reflect his righteousness. And so I'm going to begin reading at verse 4, and I'm kind of skimmed through some of this. But And he had to pass through Samaria. So just talking about Jesus. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar. Uh, near the fields that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, so Jesus was tired, y'all, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. And a woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Say, hey, I'm thirsty, I'm tired. Let me get something to drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink for me? A woman of Samaria. So all, all of you are, uh, I'm, I'm not going to assume. So in this period of time, right, you had Jesus, a Jew, and then you had Gentiles, a Samaritan woman, right? And they didn't get along. They didn't like each other. There was no like, no, we don't talk. We don't communicate. You know what I mean? There was, there was none of this. Yeah, that, that wasn't something that was done. And so here she is. She's at the well, right? Jesus was there. He's leaning on. He's like, tired, you know, breathing hard maybe. I don't know, whatever it is. But it talks about him being tired, right? 
And here comes this woman, and I, she probably has her pail and all the things, you know, and she's like um, coming up to me. He's like, hey, I'm thirsty. I need something to drink, right? And so we enter into a conversation with somebody who maybe many people would say, or you'll see later on in the story, the disciples, when he saw him talking to the Samaritan woman, why are you talking to her? Why are you spending time conversating with this person? These are, now Jesus' disciples we walked with on a day-to-day basis, right? The people that we walk with on a day-to-day basis as a believer, sometimes the people who we walk with (laughs) may think we're crazy for how we're called to love our neighbor through righteousness. We may be challenged to have to go against the cultural norm of what it means to be this person, that I go to this job and I live in this setting and I go to these places. Well, when the scripture says love your neighbor, when it's describing what love is, sometimes that breaks those norms and we have to enter into a place that feels uncomfortable, but that's where God is. That's where God meets us. And so here in Scripture, as you, as you keep reading, as you keep going through, you'll find that Jesus was, like I said, tired from the journey, but purposely engages, his purpose for engaging her was to share truth and walk in obedience. He knew that he was supposed to go through Samaria to engage her at that time, and we don't always know, right, who's going to cross our path, but that was his purpose. But he was so set on doing the will of the Father, he was so set on walking in righteousness and being in obedience with Scripture, being in obedience to who he is called to be, we are supposed to be so set on doing what God has called us to do, being who God has called us to be in righteousness, that we engage those who sometimes it doesn't seem like we should be engaging. And as he did that, he was able to minister to her from start to finish, showed up in the midst of her mess. Yes, judging the behavior, right? He knew she had multiple, wife, multiple, I'm sorry, multiple husbands, right? And the man that you with right now, that ain't really your husband. So you just a whole bunch of mess right now, right? He shows up to a person who is literally going in through the midst of this mess and says, but there's hope for you. Because I see you through the eyes of God creating you, and there's hope for you. And my posture is not to condemn you as the individual, but to address truth about your behaviors. Because your behaviors are are, are, uh, a reflection of where the righteousness is in you. So how do I challenge you through this love? And so I'm sure there's points and times where we have our conversations with people, right? And what I want to encourage you during those times and these conversations is that you ask the Lord to change my eyes, change my ears, so I can see this person in front of me as I should. The opportunity for them to know you as I've been able to know you. And so our actions as believers don't always make sense especially to unbelievers. But when it's walking in obedience, just as Jesus did here, and when his disciples got back, they said, man, what are you, what are you doing? Who, why are you talking to her? It didn't make sense to them, but he was walking in obedience. So we're going to jump back to uh, 1 Corinthians. Because as we're looking at what it means to love your neighbor through righteousness. You know, one of the the greatest opportunities that I've had in my lifetime has been, obviously, the greatest opportunity is walking as a believer in in this life, right? Praise God for that, the gift of salvation. And since then, about four years ago, I started a journey serving as the director for a place called City Life, which many of you have heard of, many of you know, um, doing youth ministry for an organization called Youth for Christ. And I'll tell you, I was actually approached about this job, and when I was asked about it, 
I remember sitting in the first interview and I said, I don't actually want to run after school center. I'm not interested in and hanging out with kids in that way. Like I knew I, like I, I was working with kids, I had been working with kids, but in this sense I was like, ah, I'm not interested. But I knew that God was saying, this is an opportunity for you to minister my gospel and I want you to pursue it. I want you to walk in obedience even though you don't feel like it, even though you don't want to, I want you to walk in obedience and I want you to pursue this. Long story short, I go through this, and I don't know how many of you know the context. So the City Life Center is across the street from Southside High School, in the heart of our Southeast community, with young people who are broken, who are hurting, some of them hungry, not all of them, but some of them hungry, some of them beautiful families, others broken families, all kinds of statuses, labels, names. And I remember walking into that place the first day and I'm like, Lord, you want me to do what? You want me to be here? And the prayer that I prayed, Lord, give me the eyes to see. Give me the ears to hear. And he filled my heart with love for my neighbor to see them unto righteousness. Not as they are, not in their current state, but as who they shall be. Because not every kid that walks through the door ends up coming to love Jesus. Let's just be honest. In the year 2021, no, I'm sorry, 2019, the year 2019, I lost a kid to gun violence, and actually, it wasn't because they were involved in gangs. They were leaving work one day, and a man at the gas station, I don't, we still don't know all the, all the stories, but they lost their lives that day to gun violence. Over this past year, 20, 2022, I had a couple of the teenage young ladies who got pregnant this year, three, three kids that were born as teenage moms. And so it's not, it's not, it's not pretty, <laughs> it's not cookie cutter, it's not nice, it's not behaviors that I desire to see them in, it's not ways of life that I desire to see them in, but Lord, give me your eyes. And I literally, there's a young lady who will have her baby in November, she's gone through her pregnancy, baby's due in November, and I'm checking in on her, how are you doing? And she said, uh, long story, we got to a point in the conversation where she said, Reggie, I appreciate you texting me because I never feel like you judge me, but I feel like you always see me. And I sent a text back, so I said, it's not that I don't judge you, <laughs> it's that I love you more the the behaviors that you're committing because God is still doing something in your life. See, what what she chooses to do on a day-to-day basis, I don't agree with. It breaks my heart because I've spent hours in conversations and time, but I'm willing to carry this burden through the midst of this so that she can see Jesus, so that she can be moved towards righteousness through this witness. Through this witness. How, how, what, I want you to take a moment and think about where in your life, who in your life, are you the example of what it means to follow Jesus? And when is it where you get to the place where you stop allowing for God, where you stop allowing for the Holy Spirit to be the witness in you, and you mess it up. We mess it up. I mess it up. Why stop looking at my neighbor through the lens of, you're a sinner just like me, and your sin is no different from mine. 
we're broken together, and let's carry this burden together towards righteousness. I'm getting all off track now. Let me get back on back to my notes. Where I, I don't want to keep y'all too long now. I know. I gotta stay on time, but let's see where am I? So we talk about it with our neighbor, right? What it means to love and what love looks like. It's patient and kind, does not envy, does not boast. But can we zoom in a little closer? I see a lot of married couples in the congregation, a lot of couples in the congregation. Can we move in a little bit closer? How does that, how does that translate to loving my wife, to loving my husband? Am I patient? Am I kind? When we have those conversations, right, because we all have them, those conversations, how am I dealing with leaning into these conversations with patience, with kindness, withholding my version, my perspective of truth loosely to be able to say, how can we come together? Because love is patient and love is kind. When we look at verse 6, it says, It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices with truth. I don't, I don't celebrate the fact that I had a I told you so moment in marriage. Maybe I do. Sometimes I do. I'm, uh, I'm saying in general what you're not supposed to do, right? I'm not supposed to celebrate the fact that I had a told you so moments. Every once in a while, I get like one every month, right? One, one I told you so. But it's not that I'm celebrating the I told you so. But instead, through prayer, through reading of Scripture, behind the scenes, when my wife is off at work, when my wife is in the bed and I'm over here, or that's rarely, she, usually she's out of bed before me, but regardless of the, when I'm by myself with God, right, because of this covenant that means everything to me, how often am I praying and saying, Lord, let truth be at the center of all of this. Not my will, but yours be done, and in your timing that we draw closer to you through this, whatever this is, whether it's a preference or whether it's a principle. When a brother or sister across town is shot and killed, is it, oh, there goes another one. It's just happening again. When another young lady is impregnated as a teen, is it, oh, there goes another one. Is there, it's happening again. When Scripture says that we don't rejoice in the wrongdoing, but rejoice in the truth. How can we change our, our perspective and say, okay, well, how can I step in to bring truth to that? How can I love and bring truth to that? Not condone the sinful nature, not condone the sinful manner of living, but to bring truth to it in love. Verse 8 says, love never ends. Love never ends. And I thank God that his love for me never ends. His love for you never ends. I'm grateful because I need his grace every day. From the time that I wake up and roll over instead of sitting up and praying and getting to my word from, from that moment all the way until... Simple things like not praying for my food that I'm grateful for, to not being grateful for my wife. I need the grace. I don't know about you, but I need the grace. I need that love that never ends. And we need to be those who carry this love that never ends. Let me see. Move along so I can land this plane and we can get on out of here. Let me see. So, I'm sorry, I, I jumped too quick. I'm 
supposed to be on verse 7. So verse 7 says, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. I'm going to read that again. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Why does love do this? Why does love do this? Why does love bear all things, believe all things, hope all things, and endure all things? To reflect God's righteousness in us. To reflect God's righteousness in us. So I ask you, as you read this, how are, how are you checking our righteous behaviors? How are we checking our righteous behaviors? Because there's plenty of grace for us when we get it wrong. We, are, we understand that there's grace for us when we get it wrong. But our strive is to get it right. Our daily strive is to get it right. So how do we check our righteous behaviors? What are the questions that we're asking ourselves to check for the pulse on whether we're choosing righteousness today? How often are we doing that? Is it once a week? Is it once a month? Is it once a year? Or like the Apostle Paul tells us, are we dying daily? Are we dying daily to our emotions, our own feelings, our own thoughts, so that we can reflect God's righteousness? I'll ask you, how often does our righteousness cause us to be arrogant? Oh, because I don't deal with that. I got that down. No, I, I made it. I, I took these steps. How often does our righteousness cause us to be arrogant versus patient? How often does checking our behavior cause for us to bear the burdens of one another? See, in, today, in, in our society, it's so easy for us to become individualized it's all about me. It's all about what I desire. Oh, I need this. I'm going to go get it. Oh, I need that. I'm going to go get it. Oh, I don't like this job. I'm just going to leave. Oh, I don't do this. I don't. Right? So there's, there's such an individualized nature to what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. But Scripture is very clear that love bears all things. We have people who are literally walking with heavy burdens heavy burdens, where their hearts ache. They physically ache. Where they're literally hurting and we walk right past them. Oh, the service is over, we walk right past them. Now, what I will say is that this church has done an amazing job over the last couple of years of seeing each other and congregating with each other because I felt it over the times that I come. Every time I come, there's more and more new faces that come up and say, hey, welcome back. And with that, there's still more people hurting. There's still new burdens being created every day, right? That we're called to carry with each other. Because as we know in reading scripture that when that cross got heavy for Jesus, right, there was somebody who carried the cross with Jesus. So I know if Jesus needed somebody to help him carry that cross, then I need somebody to help me carry my burdens. Regardless of what we think, how easy or how simple that, thing, oh, it's, it's just this. Why can't, it does, that's not what it's about. It's about carrying the burden of our brother and our sister as they hurt. It's about carrying the burden of those who can't carry it by themselves. And I want to encourage you as we end our time. And I'm not going to read the last scripture because then I'll probably start talking too much. But I want to encourage you as we end our time that your prayer be this. Lord, give me the eyes to see your people. Give me the ears to hear your spirit and the courage to walk in righteousness with those around me. 
Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the power of your spirit. Lord, I thank you for this word. Father, I thank you for scripture that is God-breathed, God-inspired, divine, that is able to transform the lives, that is able to penetrate our hearts and lead towards action. Father, I pray for every person who is under the sound of my voice, here in the sanctuary, online, and believers all over this community, all over the U.S. and around the world. Father, I pray, Lord, that you continuously make us over, make us anew, renew our minds, transform us, God, into more righteousness. God, not that just we start doing more good works, Father, but into true forms of righteousness. Lord, give us the eyes to see our brother and our sisters who are hurting, who are lost, who are hungry. Father, give us the eyes to see those who you are calling back unto yourself, who you are restoring back unto yourself, Lord God. Father, break our hearts for what breaks yours. Let us not just cast judgment, but break our hearts, God, that lead us towards action, that spur us on to do what you have called us to do, to be all that you have called us to be. And Father, we thank you for your grace in the midst of all of this, Lord, that when we get it wrong, Father, that we can go back to Scripture that shows that you love us endlessly, that you will guide us through the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may be called back unto you, and that when our time comes and we are on the other side of eternity, that we may hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. My name is Allison, and I'm also an elder here, and it's my privilege this morning to lead us through communion. Beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, the meal that we are about to celebrate is a feast of remembrance, of communion, and of hope. We come remembering that our Lord Jesus Christ perfectly fulfilled God's law, even to death on the cross. Because of God's eternal covenant of grace, we are accepted. We will never be forsaken. We come to commune with the same Christ who has promised to be with us always. Christ is the true bread which nourishes us and the vine in whom which we must live if we are to bear fruit. The Holy Spirit unites us into one body and in communion with all the saints. So we receive this supper in Christ's love and our affection for one another. We come in hope, believing that as surely as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we will be raised from the dead into eternal life. Brothers and sisters, if you have not yet submitted your life to Jesus, if you're still trying to figure out who he is, we ask that you not join us at the table today. It's not that we don't want you to join us. We truly do but we would never ask you to take part in a meaningless ritual. And if you came today without knowing Jesus that way, that's what it would be. Instead, we do ask that you pray. Pray in your seats. Ask God to reveal himself to you and know that we are also praying for you. We want you to come when you can come in truth and in faith. Christ Community Church does invite all who would forsake their sin and seek salvation in Jesus alone to join us at this table. When you're ready, we simply ask that you come from your seats, go up the middle aisle, and come around to the edges. There are hand sanitizers available on either side. As you approach the table, do so with your hands cupped, and the elder will place bread inside your hands. There is gluten-free avail bread available in the white cups, if that's a need that you have. The elder will also place a cup in front of you on the table. We ask that you pick it up and return to your seat. We ask that you hold the bread and the cup until all have been served so that we can take it together.
Brothers and sisters, on the night when he was betrayed, we know that Jesus took the bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it, saying, take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. In the same way, after he'd eaten, he took the cup, and after giving thanks, he blessed it and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for many. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you declare the Lord's death until he comes.
the communion of the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus. Take and eat. Join me in prayer. Father God, we come with empty hands. We are broken by our sin, and we need a Savior. And so we thank you, Lord, for the holy work that you allowed for Jesus to accomplish on the cross for our sake. We ask now that you guide us in your perfect ways of love. Amen. Please stand again and worship with us.
to our house tonight at 6 o'clock for food and fellowship. I've been burdened throughout the sermon to show love, foster love. We need to love each other, and please just come to our house. Um, if you're here, you can come up to me after the service or... Wow. <laughs> the spirit really does move in this place, doesn't it? <laughs> Just a few announcements. Uh, Wednesdays at 7 p.m. here at the church, um, we, we have a session where we uh, review creeds, uh, confessions, and catechisms. Um, so welcome anybody that would like to participate in that. Also, a couple of other outreach opportunities. Um, there are uh, shoes for the Abbott Elementary's Girls on the Run program. Um, we're still looking to, uh, to partner with the, the church Fort Wayne on uh, buying nine pairs of shoes, and, and uh, hopefully we can get that wrapped up soon. And lastly, on October 26th at 10 a.m., uh, we have the opportunity to work on some gifts for the Abbott Elementary teachers just to, to spread some love uh, on them and, and let them know that... that um, that we walk in this in this world together, and um, that we hopefully can uh, pick up some of their burdens and help them through. So, now with that, uh, please receive this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord turn His face towards you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of His countenance and give you peace. Go from this place in love for one another. Amen. Worthy is the Lamb who slain.